Good afternoon. This is Dan Abreu, Senior Project Associate with uh, SAMHSA National Gain Center. Um, this afternoon we have Dr. Marvin Swartz to discuss with us assisted outpatient treatment. Who are good candidates? Uh, we're fortunate to have Dr. Swartz speak with us on this topic. He's certainly one of the lead researchers in the country. Um, in response to preferences identified by the sites, uh, this, uh, this, this webinar uh, focusing on good candidates, you know, recognizes that criteria across states differ regarding points of referral, even attitudes about AOT may be different, and state criteria also differ. Still, uh, there are um, common elements across programs that I think you'll find relevant today. Uh, a couple logistic issues first. We're going to ask so that we can document attendance that you sign uh, in the chat field uh, the, your names and the names of anybody that may be listening with you so we can, we can have that documentation. Um, as you can see, Dr. Swartz uh, has a broad range of experience in this area, a network member in the MacArthur Foundation Research Network on mandated treatment, he led the Duke team conducting the first randomized trial of involuntary outpatient commitment in North Carolina, and also the legislatively mandated evaluation of the assisted outpatient treatment in New York, as, as well as uh, research on advanced directives in North Carolina. Um, he's had numerous awards and uh, we're pleased to have him with us. Next slide. I'll let you read uh, the statement there. So um, before I turn you over to Dr. Swartz, please make sure that your phones are muted. We prefer not to hear any hold music. Uh, so make sure your, your phones are muted and uh, uh, and at the end we'll have questions uh, and you can have your chance to discuss your issues with Dr. Swartz at that time. This webinar will be recorded. Dr. Swartz. Uh, thank you very much um, and welcome everyone. I uh, send you greetings from snowy North Carolina where we have a atypical uh, large accumulation of snow and we're paralyzed here. So um, what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about some of the research background about uh, AOT, um, just so that uh, we're on the same page. And then we'll talk um, about how to think about candidates. Uh, a little bit about how I got into this. I was an a inpatient psychiatrist and a community psychiatrist, uh, and I was also working in um, the North Carolina prison system as a, as a psychiatrist in a variety of uh, uh, clinics. And, uh, you know, as many of you have encountered, I uh, saw a lot of the same patients across these settings, uh, patients we would call back then revolving door patients. I'd see them on my inpatient unit, see them in prison. Uh, if they weren't the same people, they were very similar people with uh, similar uh, problems with uh, treatment adherence and a range of other problems. And so we got interested in um, trying to understand whether outpatient commitment, which was on the books in North Carolina, uh, might help uh, in terms of addressing these uh, re revolving door patients, patients with problems with treatment adherence who would fall uh, out of care. And so um, we started uh, trying to conduct studies on AOT, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that now. But my background to this was really as a clinician, um, just seeing this terrible um, uh, dilemma of patients who uh, really could not or would not avail themselves of, of treatment um, in, in the settings that I was working in. It's the research that we've uh, done over the years has been supported uh, by NIMH, by the MacArthur Research Network on Mandated Community Treatment, and then uh, also the New York Office of uh, State Office of Mental Health when we did the evaluation of New York's uh, program called Kendra's Law. 
So uh, let me just say a little bit uh, to to, to um, get us all on the same page to talk about the, the criteria for outpatient civil commitment in North Carolina, because we're going to come back to this. Uh, but I think this is sort of a common point of reference that we can use in uh, thinking about candidates. So in North Carolina, we had one of the first so-called preventative uh, statutes. Uh, so that uh, you did not have to already be committed to an inpatient unit and be stepped down. You could also step up to outpatient commitment from the community. Uh, and so we were one of the now, I think, 10 states that have a so-called preventive statute that allows people uh, before they relapse uh, to be outpatient committed. Having said that, one of the important things to recognize is that in most of the studies we've seen and the studies we've conducted, uh, the vast preponderance of uh, candidates, uh, people who are selected for outpatient commitment, start as an inpatient, um, under inpatient commitment, and step down to the outpatient commitment order. And you'll see a little bit about this later. But about 80% in um, New York, for example, start from an inpatient setting. So here are the criteria for outpatient uh, commitment in North Carolina. The presence of a serious mental illness, the capacity to survive in the community with available supports, a clinical history indicating a need for treatment to prevent deterioration that would predictably result in dangerousness. So that's the preventive threshold. And then a mental status that limits or negates the individual's ability to make informed decisions to seek or comply voluntarily with recommended treatment. So uh, there you have the, the criteria that we use. But I will say that um, the vast preponderance of patients who get outpatient commitment in North Carolina start uh, from an inpatient facility, and they can have uh, a split commitment, so they have a period of inpatient commitment followed by outpatient commitment, or while they're in the hospital, they could receive an outpatient commitment order uh, that would continue their care. And in either case, they're stepping down uh, from inpatient hospitalization. And many might argue that uh, under those circumstances, uh, circumstances, it's really a less restrictive alternative to an inpatient commitment because it's a stepping down process. So the study, the first study we conducted, which we call the Duke Mental Health Study, uh, was in the uh, north central region of North Carolina. And I live in Durham there. And uh, Durham, we regard as a city, although many of you probably wouldn't think of it as a city. It's a population of about 300,000. And uh, this was a catchment area that served one state hospital and several other uh, regional hospitals, and it was a r rural and urban mix. So we had some cities in this catchment area, but um, also rural populations. And, and the idea was to uh, look at uh, whether we could implement outpatient commitment in this region, uh, and that meant uh, negotiations and agreement with uh, all the mental health centers uh, on the slide. Uh, the, the hospitals in the region, the judicial districts, uh, and all the IRBs involved, and um, uh, so on and so forth. So the, uh, let me just go back for a second. So the idea of the study was you're coming out of a hospital under having been inpatient committed. So uh, everyone was, had been inpatient committed. They were coming out of the hospital, and they had an outpatient commitment order preordained. They were leaving with an outpatient commitment order. And at that point, we approached them and said, you have an outpatient commitment order. We're conducting this study. We'll guarantee you case management in the county that you're returning to or the area program, so either Durham, Orange Person, Chatham County, Vance Granville Franklin, uh, Warren Mental Health uh, Center, or there, was, there turned out to be another city, Greensboro, that we added later. We'll make sure you have a case manager, and then we'll give you a 50-50 chance of being 
release from the outpatient commitment order. And so the study, as it was designed, was a randomized trial of a whether outpatient commitment exerted any beneficial effect over and above the effect of consistent case management. So uh, in this case, it was not assertive case management. It was not assertive community treatment. But it was a relatively intensive form of case management. So uh, it's something you might call intensive case management, uh, case managers with relatively low caseloads. And so patients were then followed up for a year, either under the outpatient commitment condition or uh, immunized against outpatient commitment. And one of the wrinkles there was that because we couldn't control the length of the court order, uh, depending on what the judge had previously ordered, people ended up having various periods of outpatient commitment if they were in the outpatient commitment order uh, group. And the people who had no outpatient commitment were immunized against it for a year. So what did we find? Uh, we found that the um, if you got outpatient commitment and we followed you then from month to month across the trial, that um, you had a third lower likelihood of being rehospitalized during that period of time. So straight up, looking at the intent to treat group month to month over that tw those 12 months, the odds of being rehospitalized in that analysis were a third lower. But we also found something else which we featured in most of our publications, and that was that really the benefit of outpatient commitment was nested in the group that got 180 days or more of outpatient commitment. So this group um, with 180 days or more of outpatient commitment uh, were less likely to be re-hospitalized um, over the uh, period of the study. And there was almost no benefit to having a short period of outpatient commitment. And you can see that in the length of stay slide which shows that if you had 180 days or more of outpatient commitment, your average length of stay is, was 7.5 days, as opposed to about 30 days, either for people who had short outpatient commitment, the less than 180 days, or the control groups. Now, I know that many of you are looking at that and say, well, um, that's still a pretty long length of stay, 7.5 days. But in those days where length of stays, this is in the 90s, then length of stay then were um, not, you know, we're probably in the 30-day uh, range, so that a reduction of length of stay to 7.5 days was uh, uh, pretty remarkable. So we saw that um, people were less likely to be rehospitalized, and their length of stay was shorter, and the longer the period of outpatient commitment, the better. We also found that if you had a, one of these longer periods of outpatient commitment, uh, you are less likely to uh, ha, uh, evidence any violent behavior, although the violent behavior really was the kind of pushing and shoving and minor violence. We're not talking about mass shootings or serious acts of violence. We're talking about minor acts of violence. And you see here again that that finding was largely a function, uh, largely nested in the group that had a longer period of outpatient commitment. And if you didn't have a longer period, that the, the effect on violence was um, non-significant. We also found, and this was true for the intent to treat sample and not only a function of a longer period of outpatient commitment, that people who were uh, victimized um, of uh, the people who were in the outpatient commitment group were much less likely to be victims of crime during that 12 months um, under, uh, in, in the outpatient commitment group. So that was an important finding, too, since victimization uh, is rampant in this population. So that, those, those are some of the main findings uh, from that. I, w I don't want to uh, spend too much time on that study, although I will say we also found that there was improved subjective quality of life as rated by the patient. Um, there was better medication adhe adherence. Uh, in general, in most measures of functioning, people did better. The next um, major study we're involved in was Kendra's, the evaluation of Kendra's Law. 
called the AOT program in New York. And that's, this is important because if you look at a state that uh, carefully implemented and <coughs> excuse me and um, systematically implemented AOT, uh, you have to point to New York State because uh, it, it was the place where um, new money was applied to both the implementation of the AOT program, but also in the growth of new services. So something on the order of $25 million was put into running the program uh, and its infrastructure, and then about $125 million was uh, put into uh, expand community services, largely ACT and intensive case management programs uh, in New York. Uh, so it's, it w it's an unusual program, and we did the evaluation of it in the second five years. The, the structure of the legislation is that it has to be reauthorized every five years, in part because of the opposition to the program. And what we found is that uh, folks under AOT were far more likely to receive DACT or ICM. Uh, first in the first 180 days, the first line there, they, um, they were 242 percent more likely to get uh, ACT and ICM. And then in the second uh, six months, uh, that went up a little bit more. And then uh, importantly, in terms of receiving and having in possession the appropriate medication for their condition, their medication uh, possession, which is a measure of treatment adherence, of medication adherence, went up dramatically to, by the second six months, 88 percent consistently had the right medication for their condition, and they had a supply at all times. Uh, and they had, this is based on refills at the pharmacy of their medications. It's an imperfect measure of adherence because uh, clearly, people could get their refills uh, without taking the medicine, but it's it's a, um, a a measure that people use in populations to measure treatment uh, adherence. We also saw that hospital admissions went down and days of hospitalization went down, particularly with the longer periods of AOT. And then I think one of the other important findings that hasn't really gotten the attention that it might have because we reported a lot of different things is the fact that, <coughs> excuse me, that um, we saw evidence that AOT exerted an effect even for patients who were receiving ACT or ICM. And so what this analysis shows is that the monthly probability of hospitalization was reduced 43 to 57 percent for participants who were receiving AOT plus ACT or ICM. This is important because a lot of the crit critics of AOT say, well, if people got the premier treatment or the most intensive treatment like ACT or ICM, well, they wouldn't need AOT. Well, we saw evidence here from New York that even among clients receiving ACT or ICM, AOT did exert a beneficial additional effect, reducing rates of hospitalization by about 50 percent. We also saw that arrests went down in the AOT group, although uh, in this case, when we also looked at people receiving intensive services without AOT, there was a benefit in terms of reduced hospitalization. But that middle column uh, shows you that um, the rate of arrest went down, was about half in the group that got uh, AOT. So the overall summary that we delivered to the legislature, um, and this is our group at uh, Duke and, and in partnership with PRA and the MacArthur Network, we concluded that the program does improve a range of important outcomes for its recipients, that the increased services available under AOT clearly improve recipient outcomes. But we did also find, and this is based on multiple sources of data, that the court order itself 
and its monitoring by the AOT teams appear to offer additional benefits in improving outcomes, and that the AOT order exerts a critical effect on service providers. So we've written and argued elsewhere that it's not just the court order as, it's, as it exerts its effect on the patient, but the court order also has effect on the families, has, and it has effect on treatment providers and systems. And it has the effect of also, and this is a phrase that's used a lot about AOT, it also commits the system to the patient because the court is saying, we want you to pay attention to this particular patient. And so we have studied this and seen that service providers uh, kind of step up their game when they're dealing with someone under an AOT order. Now, if you summarize the evidence, and I'm going to stop on the evidence piece of this in a minute, you'll see, and probably uh, those of you who you know, delved into the literature will see that despite what I've just said, most people would say there's mixed evidence about the effectiveness of outpatient commitment. And there's been three evidence reviews since 2000. One was a study by the RAND Corporation. One was a study by the, a group in the UK. Um, and the final was a, a, Cochrane, a Cochrane Collaborative Report, uh, all about looking at systematic reviews of outpatient commitment, largely favoring any evidence from uh, randomized trials and not weighting uh, evidence from non-randomized trials, so quasi-experimental and naturalistic studies. So, so all those evidence reviews will say, well, uh, we don't see evidence that outpatient commitment works. However, uh, in the three studies uh, that we've been involved with, the pilot study at Bellevue, um, there, was, there was no benefit uh, to the pilot AOT program at Bellevue. But we do argue that there was a benefit in our study in North Carolina and in the New York study that um, looked at the entire AOT program from the beginning to um, and it's in its first 10 years of operation. So uh, we would have to say a fair um, summary of the evidence is sort of mixed. And this is how we think about it. That one, it's not a, you can't think about outpatient commitment as if it's like a drug and say, well, if I give drug A versus drug B, is drug A better than drug B? That, and that's sort of the paradigm of a randomized trial or a drug trial. Um, and that outpatient commitment is really a much more complex community intervention. And that how it's implemented, how it's carried out, how the service system works really determines um, how, how effective it is. And so rather than saying, can, uh, is outpatient commitment effective or is AOT effective, we would argue that the better way to, to look at this is to say, can outpatient commitment be effective and for whom? And we would say that this is conditioned, whether it's effective, is conditioned on effective implementation, whether there's a provision of intensive community services, and whether there's an adequate dur duration of the court order. And that position uh, is echoed in the American Psychiatric Association's position statement on outpatient commitment, or AOT, which was uh, published about a year ago and is online at the American Psychiatric Association. And their first statement about it is that involuntary outpatient commitment, if systematically implemented and resourced, can be a useful tool to promote recovery through a program of intensive outpatient services designed to improve treatment adherence, reduce relapse and rehospitalization, decrease the likelihood of dangerous behavior or serious deterioration among a subpopulation of patients with severe mental illness. And so it's this last point, subpopulation, of patients with severe mental illness that we want to focus on here. So now let's 
uh, talk about this issue of selecting candidates for AOT. So the first question you have to ask yourself is, uh, if you see a candidate, a potential candidate, does the person meet the statutory criteria in your region, in your state, for AOT? And I bring up here again an example uh, from North Carolina. So does the person have a serious mental illness? Uh, and we would say that that's um, really a psychotic, more or less a psychotic condition or a recurrent severe mental illness um, and not something like a personality disorder uh, or something in that range. Uh, most states state the second criteria uh, in different ways, but uh, can the person get along in the community and um, function in the community with available supports, including outpatient commitment? And is there a clinical history that can document that absent um, a program like this, the person would become dangerous again? So it's a, you're applying it at a threshold that is uh, before the person meets commitment criteria. And in our case, we have this additional proviso um, that they have a mental status that limits and negates the individual's ability to make informed decisions to comply voluntarily with recommended treatment. Now, some people question that criteria and say, well, are you saying that the person lacks capacity? And really, that's not what the legislative intent was of, of, the, of, of that particular criteria. And it was really, uh, is, is the person likely to comply voluntarily with recommended treatment? Or do you really need the court order to try to leverage uh, compliance? So looking at your criteria, I think, are very important in thinking about as the first step in terms of thinking about who's a good candidate for AOT. Now, another way I like to think about this um, is to recognize that AOT is not a big um, some clinicians even complain that it has no teeth. But on the whole, it's a very modestly coercive intervention. Now, I know that um, there's many folks who are bitterly um, opposed to the coerciveness of AOT. But in truth, it's only modestly coercive because um, forced medication is not permitted. Um, often, the, the sanction is uh, being transported to treatment for an evaluation. So uh, in that regard, I think about there being a therapeutic window around AOT. And I'm borrowing the, this term. Uh, many of you will recognize, particularly if you're my age and um, uh, use some of the psycho uh, psychotherapeutic drugs that had a therapeutic window. That's the way I think about it. So recall, uh, we used to think that some antidepressants uh, you had to give in a certain range. And if you gave too much, it didn't work. And if you gave too little, it didn't work. So there was a sweet spot uh, in which it was most, the agent was most therapeutic. Well, I think you can think about AOT that way, too. Uh, it is not that powerful. So if you have a militant refusenik, um, someone who has no intention ever of taking medication um, and has shown every evidence that they're going to resist anything you do, they're probably a poor candidate. Um, it's really the people who, are, um, who could adhere with a nudge that you're probably going to get the best results with. There are some people who are not adherent for other reasons, that um, you know, the system, the service system hasn't addressed their need. Um, for example, they're not adherent with medication because they can't get to the pharmacy or they um, don't have the family support they need. And so it's not that they are truly not adherent, it's that there are barriers to adherence that can be addressed other ways. 
so there are people who are, quote, not sick enough to need AOT, and there are people that are, quote, too sick um, to uh, benefit from AOT. So if I'm saying that AOT, some people say, has no teeth, or I'm saying that it only has a modest level of coerciveness or uh, influence, how do we think it works? And I've said a little bit about this a few minutes ago, is that we really think that it leverages adherence, that the patient uh, in such a program gets concerted messages to adhere. And we've looked at this and found that people in, our pro in, in the programs hear from the judge, <coughs> excuse me, that you need to, that the patient needs to adhere to treatment. But that, that message also comes from significant others. There are family, you know, families will say, gee, you know, you've been in court and the judge really needs you and wants you to adhere to treatment. Clinicians and case managers echo that. And then they hear it from other court officials as well. So there's a convergence of messaging to the patient um, that they need to adhere to the treatment program. There is a limited effect of the pickup orders. Um, they're, they tend to be infrequent, and that, that's what we call them in North Carolina, where law enforcement is um, requested to pick up the person who's not adherent and transport them to treatment. And, uh, the statute in North Carolina, in speaking about this, says that the, per per um, the purpose of this is for hopeful persuasion to accept treatment. That the goal of the pickup order is to bring the person in uh, and to have a conversation about why they're not adhering to treatment and, in effect, try to get them to um, get with the program. That pickup order also by bringing the patient in also makes it possible to reevaluate the patient because then the patient's in front of you. And it makes it possible to reevaluate uh, the plan and reevaluate whether the person needs uh, a higher level of treatment and maybe inpatient commitment. So as far as I know, um, no state oper you know, permits inpatient hospitalization uh, when people are non-adherent, but the pickup order brings the person in, and if they then meet criteria for inpatient hospitalization, it might happen. So we have seen that the pickup order gets people's attentions, and I would say anecdotally and through our, our interviews with patients, um, it, it is a big event if, if a sheriff comes to your door and says, you know, you haven't been attending treatment, we're going to take you there, that it gets people's attention, it gets families' attention, but they are relatively uncommon. The other way AOT works, and I've said this, is that it prioritizes the patient, that people are focused on that patient, and importantly, mobilizes teamwork around that patient because of they're in a program that's designed to affect treatment adherence. And I think that's an important um, aspect of it. When we did the uh, evaluation of New York's AOT program, the then commissioner, um, Mike Hogan, said, you know, one of the, he, he wasn't saying anything uh, about the evidence, but he was saying, you know, one thing that occurs, uh, occurred to him about looking at how the program off, uh, worked is that it focused accountability on a patient, and that often in mental health systems, you have multiple providers involved, and people are doing things, and the communication might not be optimal, but that the AOT order affixed accountability for a patient, so that there was sort of a uh, another layer of supervision and oversight over the treatment plan that was affected by the AOT order itself. So I would say when you think about AOT and think about this construct of the therapeutic window, if it's useful to you, think about people, whether the person's, quote, sick enough, and that is, are there other reasons why the person's not adhering that can be addressed without a court order? Um, 
and whether they're too sick. If there's evidence that it really has never worked or that the person um, is, is unlikely to benefit, I would do that uh, uh, very sparingly. Uh, you also don't want to demoralize everyone with bad experiences with AOT. Another way you can think about good candidates for AOT is to ask the question, has it helped in the past? So is this someone who has responded to AOT in the past, if, if, you're in, um, if it's someone with a history, or they seem to have benefited from these types of interventions, well, then they're probably a reasonable candidate. Um, and also, sort of as a, uh, a corollary, um, if it hasn't helped in the past, is there some different approach you should take? Um, is there a missing element that you could add to the order, or in fact, uh, the treatment plan, that would make things different? So I'm not saying just because the person has failed AOT in the past, you shouldn't do it again. But you should think about, well, what was the element? Uh, what could make a difference if we did it again? And um, then when you look at, at the treatment plan, and in most, can, most situations, um, the treatment plan is reviewed by the court. In North Carolina, it isn't. Um, you have to ask yourself, so is there a practical, deliverable treatment plan? So do you have a treatment plan that should work absent non-adherence? That is, if you can use this if you can use AOT to help with adherence, is there then a good chance that the treatment plan would work? So it's really, do you have a practical, deliverable treatment plan? If you really don't, then it's unlikely that AOT would work. AOT doesn't work on its own. Um, it works via adherence to a treatment plan. And we think that what changes is that adherence. Um, and then I would say that in many places, um, the combination of a long-acting injectable uh, with AOT has been very successful. That um, it, in some ways, can simplify the treatment plan uh, and you can use the court leverage uh, to deliver the injectable. So, for example, uh, you could uh, one element of the treatment plan could be a long-acting uh, antipsychotic injectable antipsychotic, which would um, quote guarantee or help with medication adherence, um, and uh, uh, use the court order to say, well, this. This is the medication treatment we recommended. So uh, consider whether pairing a long-acting injectable and, when, and whether the person's a candidate for a long-acting injectable with, with the order. Obviously, you, a patient can still refuse medication, and you can't forcibly inject medication, but uh, we've seen good evidence that combining depot um, antipsychotics with the AOT uh, does uh, help, and, and we published about that in North Carolina. So people I would not think ab uh, about as good candidates or unlikely candidates are, one, patients who just aren't medication responsive. Um, it might still be worth a trial if you think that they never really t took the medication. Um, and po possibly it might be a mechanism to try to do a clozapine trial. But if you know someone really isn't going to respond to any medication, um, I would be skeptical whether the AOT is going to work because, uh, in part, AOT is, works via improve medication adherence. Now, there's all these other elements that, that help, like good, consistent psychosocial treatment. But one of the necessary conditions 
for the population we're talking about, as you well know, is getting the appropriate medication and, and having it consistently um, in the bloodstream. If the primary diagnosis is not a severe mental illness, uh, I would say this is a poor candidate for AOT, and particularly people with personality disorders, people with serious violence, people with very, very complex comorbidities, um, that they, they are probably not good candidates uh, for AOT, and I, and I think certainly not sex offenders and people with personality disorders. And to the extent that AOT has been uh, promoted as a remedy for serious violence, there's no evidence that um, uh, you know, mass shootings or you know, weapon violence is decreased by AOT. AOT, the argument for AOT is it's, got, it, is it's benefit in improving adherence to treatment, not in reducing violence. And so if you can make the argument in your review that it will, that there's a good chance of improving adherence and getting better outcomes that way, that's the justification, not as a remedy for serious violence. And then the final caveat I would say is that uh, if, if you have someone who uh, is homeless and you don't have a way to get them into some kind of stable housing, um, I think those people are poorer candidates. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't try, or, but um, it's, if, if you can't find the people to, for the program uh, and to administer AOT, uh, it's going to be really hard to deliver a good AOT program. So um, let me stop there, uh, and if you have comments or questions, uh, you can write them in the chat area, and we'll uh, take them up. And we also want to uh, remind you that um, we can have uh, one-off discussions uh, in office hours uh, to discuss um, these, these cases. And uh, we're happy to arrange them and talk to you uh, sites individually about um, how your program's working and, and, and how we might um, troubleshoot some of the problems you're having. So let me stop there. So uh, for those of you who have questions now, uh, unmute. don't forget to unmute your phone. And then please identify yourself and your affiliation. So uh, any questions? I see we have some typing going on. <clears throat> Dr. Swartz, I have a comment and a question in the interim. You mentioned homelessness as um, an issue of regarding whether or not somebody could be a successful AOT candidate. Uh, and across the sites, homelessness has been a, has been a significant issue. Um, uh, and in some sites more than others. But I'm wondering if any of the data from any of the research that you, sh that you uh, talked about earlier uh, looked at homo isolated homelessness as a factor in successful AOT orders. Yeah, so um, in the, uh, I think in, in some programs um, have, used AOT to address homelessness in the sense that housing providers um, are more likely to, uh, you know, if someone has AOT and they have a team wrapped around them, then that person is more attractive to many housing providers just as ACT recipients. So I, I didn't mean to say that homeless people aren't reasonable candidates for AOT. I meant that you have to address the homelessness to have a chance for success. Um, and some AOT programs have leveraged, have uh, got their clients to the front of the queue uh, for, for housing with the AOT order. I'm just saying you, you, you couldn't, you can't expect, if you can't find the person and get, you know, consistently 
interact with them, the AOT program, the AOT itself isn't going to help that much. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think think so. Think some of the sites have had used that strategy around prioritizing the AOT population with their housing providers, and they brought the housing providers in on uh, on their planning groups too. And I know that's certainly with the New York study. I'm familiar with that. Uh, the AOT, the AOT group got prioritized for housing, you know, when the referrals right. were made. So I think your point is, is well taken. So we have a, a question from Dr. Alai in uh, Nevada. What is an ideal duration for successful AOT, 6, 12, 18, or 24 months? So um, I would say more than six months is a minimum. I mean, I would say that, you, you know, you want to, we have direct evidence that six months or more is beneficial. Beyond that, I don't know about, I don't know if there's data and um, to recommend more. There is a dilemma which, you know, you have in thinking about this is, you know, say you're 12 months out and the per person's doing well, is that evidence that you could stop AOT or that you should continue it? It's like the same dilemma you have if someone's doing well on um, depot antipsychotic, if they're doing well on depot, is that reason to um, stop it or to continue it? And we really don't have that much evidence either way to think about it. So I would say at least six months, I would say if someone's still rocky in the six to 12 month period, you know, if they're adherent is still poor and they're still really needing um, the supports in AOT, I would keep them going. So I probably wouldn't uh, titrate down AOT until the person really seems to be uh, functioning without some of the adherence support um, of AOT. So I, 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 what I might do is sort of do a trial of titrating down um, some elements of it that, and see how the person does. But empirically, I, I don't have an answer for that. Just as empirically, you can't really say how long someone should get depot antipsychotics. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a matter of, I think, clinical judgment. And, and so, Jamie, Michael, do you have any? Hold on, let's get that full question up on the screen. Okay. So do you have any information about serving participants with cognitive disabilities? Um, well, as you know, um, the average person with chronic schizophrenia has significant, um, you know, cognitive impairment, uh, particularly if they have, you know, a lot of negative symptoms. And um, those folks, seem to benefit, I, I, but whether people, there's no, there's no experience that I know of of people with, you know, intellectual disabilities using it. One of the things uh, I think that might be helpful in thinking about this is you can divide people, at least in my mind, and I use this little heuristic, um, that adherence, you, you know, if you just kind of do the differential diagnosis of adherence, non-adherence, there are people that can't, won't, and don't adhere. And the people who can't, I would say, are people who just can't get it together because of cognitive impairment or can't get to the pharmacy or just, you know, they don't have the kind of supports that they need. They may not need AOT. They may just need more help. It's the people that won't or don't, I think, that are more candidates for AOT. Uh, if, 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 if they just can't remember to take their medicines or remember to get to their appointments, uh, AOT to me is not the appropriate thing to do. The appropriate thing to do is to, you know, up your game so that the person is get, has a treatment program that's more uh, attuned to their needs. Okay, so the next question um, from Patricia Gonzalez, who 
Thank you for the great insights on the specific approaches, characteristics on behalf of the judges that have been found to improve treatment adherence or outcomes. So I guess it's, it's, it's the black robe effect plus. Are there certain things that the judges do that enhance treatment adherence? Um, so yeah, let me say a little bit about the black robe effect. I know that there's been a lot of evidence I mean, there's been a lot of discussion about the black robe effect. Um, I think AOT goes well beyond the black robe effect, um, and you know, for some, and in fact, for some clients, the black robe really doesn't have much, you know, meaning. It's the, to me, it's the congruence of the efforts to get the person well served and with the program and adhering with the program that exerts its effect. So I think the, 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 the successful regimen, uh, you know, of the judges is, I think, to, um, you know, really emphasize with the client the other parties involved. And uh, so, you know, are you working with your care man, your case manager, your treatment team? Are you taking your medication? But to really emphasize the team beyond the courtroom, because the courtroom per se is not providing the treatment. The there there is the treatment. Um, and so the judges that I've worked with that I found I thought were most effective were the ones that were pointing the client towards the, their treatment resources and not focused on them on the judge and not focused on the judge as a therapeutic agent. I know that that sounds um, heretical, but uh, I don't think the charisma of the judge is the is the main therapeutic effect. I think it's that the the judge reinforces, underscores, points the client towards treatment. And even if they would say, you know, I don't know all that much about treatment. I just know that you're someone that's in front of me who's been recommended for uh, pretty comprehensive treatment. I want to see you get that. So, um, you know, there, there's been a lot written about mental health courts, uh, AOT, and drug courts and the role of the judges. Um, I think it's important for the judge to be interested but I think their charismatic power, you know, over the interval when they're not seeing the client is kind of limited, and it's really the team that delivers the effectiveness of the AOT order. Other questions? Okay, well, I look forward to, um, you know, having the opportunity to meet with you all if, um, uh, if that would be helpful. And you see here on your screen uh, that you can schedule uh, time to talk with uh, Ashley. You see her contact information there. And, um, uh, you know, hope we can um, help you think through the program. I know this is new for many of you. and. Um, uh, it takes a little bit of experience to get going. I know that you know you're all in different places, in, um, and and so your 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 laws are a little bit different. But um, if you want to talk about it, if you want to discuss it, please avail yourself of the, of the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Swartz. Uh, just one more reminder uh, around attendance. If you haven't signed in through the chat. Field, uh, please do so. Uh, and if there's no more questions, uh, Dr. Swartz, thank you. This has been very enlightening for me and I think for the rest of the participants in, in this webinar. Uh, this is, I think you're scheduled to do one or two more of these and yeah. uh, we look forward to those also. So thank you. Uh, it's Friday afternoon. People, safe trip home. Um, and uh, thank you for your participation. Yeah, thanks for your opportunity to talk about this. See you next time. Bye-bye.